Good afternoon and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Preserving Your Digital Life. I'm Eva Sorrell, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Krista White and Isaiah Beard. Krista is the Digital Humanities Librarian at the John Cotton Dana Library at Rutgers University, Newark. Krista has master's degrees in art history from the University of Colorado at Boulder and in the Anthropology of Religion from Drew University. She earned her MLIS from Rutgers School of Communication and Information in 2008. Before joining the Rutgers Libraries as their first digital humanities librarian, Krista White worked as the Visual Resources Curator for the Art, Depar art History Department of Drew University. She moved to become the training coordinator of Drew's student tech Student Technology Education Lab, and the GIS Support Specialist, where she helps students, faculty, and staff navigate and learn to use emerging technologies for teaching, learning, and unit processes. She spearheaded a number of digitization projects, including the creation of Drew's Online Information Technology Training Program for undergraduates, Drew Online Network User Training. Isaiah is the Digital Data Curator at the Scholarly Communication Center at the Archibald S. Alexander Library at Rutgers University, Newark. Isaiah's primary job at Rutgers is to establish standards and workflow practices for the digitization and coding of digital assets so they can be preserved in our digital repository known as RU Core. His background in digital preservation began with his avid interest in photography and videography and in the issues facing the field as it shifts from analog film, film formats into an increasingly digital landscape. He has researched and developed standards for the preservation of digital assets that have been adopted by a number of prominent agencies, including the Library of Congress, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in their use of PDF slash A for digital document archiving, and members of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, AMIA. Their presentation today will discuss preserving the digital audio and video files documenting our lives that many of us create on a daily basis. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Krista and Isaiah, please type them into the question box on your screen, and they will answer them as time permits at the end of their presentation. Jessica Bightley, Director of Preservation Services at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and Co-Chair of Preservation Week Working Group, will be moderating the questions. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the answers will be sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the pres presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Krista. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Krista White, the Digital Humanities Librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. And I'm Isaiah Beer, Digital Data Curator over at Rutgers University Libraries in New Brunswick. A little bit about us. Um, my particular research interests are in digitization standards, uh, specifically as they relate to the digitization of oral history collections. And I also do research related to ethical issues surrounding the digital dissemination of oral histories um, in online environments. And my specialty is really in digital data curation, uh, which deals a lot with the born digital aspects of uh, the digital landscape as it evolves, uh, mainly things that do not have an analog master uh, to start with. And uh, with that comes a bit of uh, you know, research in born digital data formats and particularly mobile device technology, since that seems to be where uh, the majority of our born digital uh, content is being created now. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly why um, you're such a great partner to have a webinar, Isaiah. I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, our, our skills really complement each other, I think. Um, 
So I want to briefly go over what our objectives are today for the webinar so that participants know what to expect. Um, we're going to be teaching you about uh, workflows for developing and implementing a digitization plan for born digital items that you create with an emphasis on mobile technologies such as smartphones. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about file formats, uh, creating the kinds of digital objects that will improve your chances for long-term access. So we'll talk to you about settings to use and apps to use on your digital devices, as well as standards for the preservation of born digital objects. We will be discussing different storage options that you might want to consider for long-term preservation of any objects that you create, and also the basic steps for a preservation plan. Before we go ahead and dive right in, I really want to thank our Preservation Week partners for this webinar. We wouldn't be here without you, and so we want to give a big shout out to Backstage Library Works, Archival Products, The Media Preserve, George Blood Audio Video, Gaylord Archival, Hollinger Metal Edge, and the HF Group, both their digital solutions and ECS conservation arms. Thanks so much for partnering with us to bring this programming for Preservation Week. We um, appreciate it a great deal. So I think it's important to start out with um, sort of answering the question, why is this important? And we can't really answer that question until we kind of review a bit what uh, you know the practice has been for so long. Um, I, I kind of liken this to the sort of uh, you know the shoebox in the attic kind of paradigm. Um, traditionally, collections consisted of physical analog artifacts. Um, so photographs were physical paper objects or film negatives. Uh, sometimes there were plate glass negatives too. Um, video recordings, though not quite as common as photographs, were on film or tape. Um, documents were on paper, and audio recordings were also in physical formats that evolved over the years, uh, you know, ranging from disc to tape uh, and various other formats, some more obscure than others. Um, so these recordings of history, both monumental and personal, um, persisted in these forms, even as people moved them off to back closets, attics, basements, and storage areas, um, not necessarily feeling they were relevant right then and there, but uh, still reluctant to throw them away. Um, inevitably, these analog record records of our history um, get rediscovered as found objects. Uh, so memories are stoked again. Um, the importance and significance is rediscovered. Uh, some artifacts that are of wider community or broader historical importance end up in archives and special collections and, and cultural heritage entities. Uh, and so this is the way it has been for centuries, but the paradigm doesn't really work as well in the realm of digital objects as we migrate into that for a number of reasons. Um, so this chart right here um, sort of collects the statistics for how many photos have been taken in a year. And this is based on things like film industry production standards um, and uh, you know statistics gathered from uh, groups like Facebook, Flickr, that sort of thing. Uh, Facebook by and large is, is one of the larger sort of public repositories of digital images. And what we're, sh what we're seeing in this graph basically is, um, you know, peak film for still images started around 2000. And um, let's see, you know, the, so the vast majority of film images started around there. Uh, some 86 billion photos were taken in 2000. And, and, you know, that's really where it topped out and then sort of fell as we moved into uh, primarily digital photo, photo, uh, photographic uh, formats. Uh, by contrast, Facebook alone stores some 350, new image, 350 million new images that are added by their users daily, uh, close to 128 billion yearly if you do the math. No, that's um, a crazy statistic. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's only getting larger. It's increasing steadily. Um, right now, again, if you do the math, more photos are taken every two minutes than were taken during the period be between 1826 and 1900, you know, that whole century when film was getting off the ground. Um, so this volume alone presents an enormous challenge. I mean, even at its peak, the film industry couldn't have possibly made enough supplies for camera owners to take or develop this many photos that we're taking today. And the cost for those supplies would just be astronomical. Um, but these new capabilities sort of bring new challenges to us when we're trying to archive history. Um, again, going back to that shoebox paradigm, it doesn't really work anymore. 
Uh, every time someone runs out of space on a hard drive, a smartphone, or a cloud storage account, um, they kind of have to make a choice. Um, should I buy more storage or should I start deleting things? Um, oftentimes, you know, when, when, when people have to make that decision, uh, whether they spend more money or they start cleaning things out, uh, that delete button pretty much wins out, uh, at least anecdotally. And, uh, you know, those images end up getting destroyed. Um, this really denies us the ability to, to rediscover old images that we discarded because they haven't been pushed away into a shoebox somewhere in the cloud. They're completely gone. Um, and granted, some of these images really aren't worth keeping. You know, that, that pizza you ate last night or the hilarious way your pets destroyed the furniture. But, <laughs> but educating users to be mindful of what they're deleting and the implications of not getting it back, uh, that really helps people make informed decisions about how they weed their personal digital collections. Um, so they really have to ask themselves the question, you know, how will I feel if this picture or this movie or this sound recording goes away and I can never get it back? So we're going to start off uh, giving everybody a little bit of a primer about preservation terminology. Uh, in particular, we are going to go over um, terms that you're going to hear a lot when we start to talk about standards. So I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the preservation terminology for digital audio files. Sampling rate is the number of times per second um, that a computer will sample a particular sound wave, uh, and that's usually measured in hertz, but when you are hearing about sampling rate or um, sampling frequencies, as they're sometimes called, you often see the um, value presented in kilohertz because it happens so often that you have to look at it in thousands of samples per second. Um, <clears throat> so 44.1 is uh, kilohertz is a standard CD quality sampling rate, um, and that's what most MP3s that are coming out of services like iTunes use. The bit depth is the number of data bits or the amount of information about each one of those samples that is being stored by the computer. Um, it also relates directly to the ratio of decibel levels that are recorded in a sound recording. So if you have a very small bit depth, what's going to happen is that the ratio of loud and soft sounds in a recording may not get recorded. The higher the bit depth, the wider variety of soft and loud sounds you will capture in your sample. And finally, uh, the last term related to digital audio file preservation is channels. This is the number of individual audio streams in a recording. Sometimes you'll see channels referred to as tracks. Um, and in music recording, these streams are often linked to locations. I know we've all experienced at one time or another surround sound. In that scenario, uh, there are a number of different tracks or channels for each instrument, and then uh, the location is tied to a speaker location for each track, and that's what makes it sound like you're surrounded by the instruments in the room. Complex recordings can have multiple channels, but most people are familiar with the terms mono and stereo. Mono means you only have one channel of sound in a recording. Stereo means two channels are available per recording. And Christy, you, you might also, we might also want to note that with sound, there's been a lot of debate as to uh, you know, what is the right sampling rate uh, for uh, you know, various sound recordings. You know, initially, right. the big, big uh, statement was that, well, 44.1 kilohertz is as good as you're going to get. For, for human hearing because that really captures the full breadth and spectrum of what humans can hear. But now there is a lot of uh, proponents of higher bit rates like 48 and even up to 192 kilohertz. And while some people right. are saying that, there are others who are saying, no, oh, maybe that's not so good after all. It's just going to give you extra data. Right, um, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, again, relates to the kinds of choices we're going to be talking about today, right? So uh, informing you about all of these terms and the standards that various bodies have put in place allow you to make informed choices about your preservation strategy. Right. 
Um, so going into digital video files, um, a lot of the terminology that you just saw in audio uh, pretty much carries over because a, a great deal of video that gets recorded in moving images also has an audio track with it. So, so that terminology carries over and then we have these additional terms that we have to consider. Um, frame rate, for instance. Um, pretty sure quite a few of us are aware um, when you're recording moving images, uh, that's exactly what they are, a series of still images that are played back in rapid succession. And frame rate um, really describes the number of images or frames per second that we're dealing with in a particular moving image recording. Um, you know, we have some of the common frame rates listed up here for film, uh, for a vast majority of the industry's period, it's been 24 frames per second. Um, <clears throat> for a good portion of standard definition video, we're looking at 30 frames per second, or actually slightly less than, but uh, typically people refer to it as 30. Um, some of the higher definition digital recordings are starting to come out at 60 frames per second. And um, there's also a lot of work being done with high speed capture. Uh, so if you're trying to capture something that happens in very fast motion and you want to slow it down for analysis, uh, there are some cameras that go up to 240 frames per second to make sure that they capture that motion in great detail. Um, so the, the obvious indication here is that the greater number of frames, uh, the smoother the motion, the greater amount of detail is captured in that motion uh, for the moving image. Um, another uh, terminology that we have to look at here is resolution. <clears throat> so if you're looking at your screen right now, uh, it's basically a rectangle and we measure resolution uh, by pixels. Uh, so we're taking the vertical and the horizontal measurement of how many pixels are in that image. Uh, so we have um, you know, our common resolutions here. Uh, again, looking at standard definition television, uh, when you convert it into a digital format, it's typically 640 by 480 for square pixels. Um, you know, when we started out with HD, uh, there was 720p, and that's you know 1280 by 720. Um, there's some some mid-range uh, types of resolutions there. It's 1600 by 900, and that's considered HD plus, so to speak. Uh, then you get your full high definition, uh, 1080p, and that's 1920 by 1080 pixels. Uh, and now we're going into even higher amounts of detail uh, with certain recordings. Um, you know, 2K and, and, and wide quad HD uh, comes out at uh, 2560 by 1440 pixels. And now we're hearing about 4K, and, and you know, that's the big hot, uh, big ticket television that you want to get at Best Buy. You know, that, that could pop, tops out at about 3840 by 2160. And we're going even further than that uh, with uh, the formats to come. They're talking about 8K and even 16K now, which is pretty amazing. Um, so, moving right along, we have aspect ratio, and again, if we look at our, our computer monitors or whatever screen we're looking at right now, there's a big rectangle, and um, the viewing aspect ratio is, is really a description of the length versus the height um, in terms of that particular ratio. If you're looking at, uh, again, common standard definition television and some of the older computer monitors, uh, it looked a little bit more square than rectangle, and that was 4-3 aspect ratio. Uh, when we moved on to HD and widescreen, um, the, the common ratio there became 16 by 9, and uh, film, uh, so if you're looking at a movie theater screen, uh, you're probably looking at a 21 by 9 aspect ratio. Um, and the last uh, big term that we want to look at here is, is quantization. Um, so if you, if you refer back to um, the audio terminology, um, bit depth is probably the best analogy. Uh, to when you're when you're thinking about quantization, um, and it's really the you know the process of determining which portions of an image can be discarded with minimal subjective loss. So what's what's happening with digital video is that a lot of the um, uh, algorithms that are being used to encode moving images uh, basically make decisions. They analyze the image and they try to determine what uh, the human eye will pay most attention to and what will probably be you know not paid attention to or discarded. And uh, it is the that latter part that um, you know it basically decides to throw away that data if possible uh, to try to get a more uh, more efficient type of bit rate or a more efficient image uh, with a lower uh, file size. Um, so that's really something to consider. A greater amount of quantization gives you a much greater amount of detail and depth in your image. Yeah, and um, 
again, we're providing you with these terms because you will often see them in the settings of the mobile device apps that you might be using to create digital audio and video. And so knowing what they are will allow you to um, set uh, your device to record in whatever your preferred standard happens to be. And so let's move on to talk about standards. And we're going to first talk about metadata. Um, for folks unfamiliar with the term, uh, metadata is information about an object that tells you what it is, what it's about, who made it, and when and how it was made. Um, so this uh, visualization by Jen Riley and Devin Becker is only half of the metadata universe that they sort of laid out according to function, purpose, um, and different domains. And I put it here so that people can get an idea of the incredible breadth of possibility regarding metadata. What I did not want to do is intimidate you too much. So really you only need to keep three types of metadata in mind for your projects. And um, I'm going to go over those with you really quickly. Um, the first is descriptive metadata. It's that area in the lower left-hand side in purple. And descriptive metadata is really the metadata that human beings are most interested in. It's the type of metadata we use when we search in Google. It's um, names of people who are in an audio or video. It's the place where the audio or video was shot. Descriptive metadata also includes dates of when things were recorded and um, also the relationships between one digital object and another. So if we have a video of Isaiah's 12th birthday and there are also photographs, still images, from Isaiah's 12th birthday, we can describe that relationship in the descriptive metadata so that people know to go looking for those photographs if they're viewing the video and vice versa. The next type of metadata that you're going to want to record for your digital objects is the technical metadata. This is the how and when of the metadata universe. Technical metadata records information about the devices that you used to create a digital object, also the software that you may have used, your preservation standards, your sampling rate, your bit depth, your uh, aspect ratio, chosen aspect ratio, um, and quantization rates, as well as um, the duration, the length of or the size of the object that you created. And this is important because people who are stewarding these digital objects in a hundred years are going to need to know how we created something and what we used to create it because the technology is going to look very different and if they have an idea of how the original object was created they can more easily transfer it to newer technologies and preserve it in the long term. The last type of metadata I want to talk about, oh did you want to say something about technical metadata Isaiah? Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, just to kind of bring that home, uh, we're running into this problem a lot now with some of the older uh, video formats. You know, there's, for, for a long time, uh, you know, the, the streaming format that really ruled the web was Flash. And, um, you know, there was a lot of poor planning that happened in, in a lot of different uh, video projects. And so Flash ended up being the only format that you had. And so now there's this big movement away from Flash and other formats. And, and you know, even looking earlier back, you're looking at real media, if, if that sounds familiar to people, um, and QuickTime, you know, those are starting to fall away as well. And, uh, you know, a, a lack of technical metadata really gives us a lot of problems in terms of, of trying to reopen those formats. And, and transcode them into something more modern. So definitely there's a lot of planning uh, required to make sure that this stuff lasts even as we go through different iterations of technology. Right, and you know, it is an investment of time up front to record all of this, but the nice thing is if you're using the same device over and over again to make your audio or video recordings, all you have to do is copy and paste that technical metadata 
um, from one from the information about one object to another until you end up changing devices. So, you know, take five, ten, twenty minutes up front to record that technical metadata, and then it's a copy paste job um, for the rest of the time that you use that particular device. Right, the and last it, what's really nice too is that some newer devices automatically embed that stuff into the file too. Yeah, so yeah, you'll you'll device. rarely ever get descriptive metadata embedded, right, Isaiah? But Absolutely. the technical mm -hmm. metadata, the technical metadata is often there with the newer devices. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Um, the last type of metadata we want to discuss is the rights metadata. This is really the legal stuff about who owns the object. Um, three things to keep in mind are um, who has the copyright, who has um, the uh, who wh who can do what with the object. So those are release forms. Um, copyright can be jointly owned, but you can't grant someone permission to do anything with a digital object until um, unless you have the copyright for it. Um, so keeping track of that, while most of us on a personal level don't need to deal with that, folks at cultural heritage institutions really need to keep a sharp eye on rights metadata for digital objects, especially if they want to be able to repurpose and reuse them into the future. So another aspect of planning when you're going into a, a digital uh, project, whether it be preservation or, or creating from scratch in digital, is uh, the type of file formats that you're going to be using. Um, in, in our projects that we work on, uh, you know, particularly here at Rutgers and in other archival spaces, uh, we really have two different types of major files that we work with. Uh, the first, of course, is the archival masters, and, and these end up being the, the, being the files that um, you know, a project uh, owner or creator uh, originally worked with. Um, we, we really recommend that uh, you know, some thought goes into the types of files that you're using to, to create your works or to digitally preserve existing ones. Um, you know, with Archival Masters, we're really looking for, for high quality, uncompressed if possible, but sometimes you know, we can't avoid that, and so we try to go with minimally compressed or even lossless compression, uh, which means you know, the file gets compressed with no loss of quality um, in a stable, well-supported, and well-documented format. Um, if you're doing something that's very obscure, that's very proprietary, and requires a very specific piece of software, um, that should sort of be setting off a little bit of alarm bells in your head um, that, uh, you know, we might run into some problems accessing these files down the road. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure people have run into problems where, you know, an old program won't work anymore when you upgrade your computer. Um, and if your files require that specific piece of software, um, then, you know, you have some real accessibility problems in the future as the technology starts to improve and you get, uh, you know, more advanced computers that just won't run that old software anymore. Uh, so we try to make sure that files are, are again, you know, well documented, um, cross-platform if possible, you know, so if you can get something that opens up in, in Mac and PC and, and even Linux, um, you know, that would be great because uh, that allows, um, you know, a wider array of, of software packages and platforms forms to be able to access your content. Um, and, you know, the thing about archival masters is we try not to, to modify them directly either. Uh, when you're doing edits, when you're doing changes or modifications, you, you create a copy of that archival master, and we call that a derivative master, and you use that to create successive virgin, versions. Um, <clears throat> a, a good analog example of this is whenever we're, we talk about a director's cut of a movie, well, a director's cut's not really possible if there hasn't been uh, a good amount of, of planning to keep those archival masters around to make sure that things that uh, would have ended up on the cutting room floor weren't saved, um, because a lot of that can then be restored later on for, for successive versions. Um, now, obviously, archival masters tend to be pretty large. Uh, they tend to be in formats that are not web friendly. Uh, and so that's when we create our presentation files. And you know, these are the, the, the final cuts, basically, the, you know, those final edits that we want to be able to show the public. Um, and they do end up being compressed because you know a lot of people's internet connections uh, aren't particularly fast or or we might be limited in, in how much bandwidth we can use and uh, you know we try to be very very efficient in delivering that content so you know web friendly versions of a, a digital object suitable for the public to stream or download those are your compressed presentation files 
And so those are the two major file types that we work with in, in a lot of digital projects. Yeah, so um, keeping in mind those uh, file formats, uh, we're going to talk about the preservation standard you're going to use because as Isaiah mentioned briefly in his discussion of the file formats, um, the preservation standard that you use can really deeply affect the size of the files that you create. And so here we have uh, preservation standard minimum preservation standards for digital audio and digital um, video formats. We have linked out to standards that include recommended sizes as well as maximum sizes for these formats. But again, um, you know, this 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate with 16-bit uh, depth and two channels for an audio recording as an uncompressed WAV file is a fairly large file when you have an hour of audio recorded. It comes out to about 600 megabytes um, per hour. But if you're recording at 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, you're going to have files that are orders of magnitude larger than that. And so you're really going to need to plan out uh, what kind of storage you're going to purchase in order to steward these objects well into the future. So now what we have here, um, we have archival standards for the creation and recording of digital files, but we also want to talk about archival standards for those file formats. And as Isaiah mentioned, you want something that doesn't depend on any one particular type of software. And so these file formats for audio and video are the non-proprietary formats, those um, file formats that can be used used across platforms. Um, the wave or broadcast wave is uh, for the purposes of creating your uncompressed archival master audio files. Um, for uh, your compressed uh, presentation files, the MP3 and the AAC standards are what you're going to want to use. And uh, Isaiah is going to talk a little bit about the file formats, the archival file, file formats for videos. Right. We pretty much have the same situation with, uh, with video as we do with audio. You know, you, you have your, your uncompressed formats. Uh, AVI tends to store a number of different formats, but among them is uncompressed frames. Um, and, you know, here at Rutgers, that is pretty much our recommended format for archiving moving images. Um, of course, the result there is that you have very, very large files. I mean, they can be, you know, upwards of 40 gigabytes for an hour, and, and that's just for standard definition video. Um, we do have, uh, you know, uh, wrappers that, uh, that are a little bit more advanced than AVI. That's MXF. Uh, Library of Congress makes a lot of use of that. Um, there are also some newer options like Motion JPEG 2000, uh, which is nice because it's a loss. You know, you can make it a lossless compressed format. Um, though there is a bit of limitations in in what software can use to access that. Um, there is, of course, other you know uh, formats like QuickTime ProRes, and that'll be pretty common if you're using a, a Mac to do video editing. Um, and uh, the vast majority of high definition cameras, both broadcast and consumer level, are using uh, what's called uh, H.264 or MPEG-4 uh, to natively store their, uh, their videos. So a lot of times you'll end up with that as your master file and, and we'll be working with that at a high bit rate. Um, for presentation formats, um, the pretty common format for the web right now is MPEG-4. Uh, so you'll see that as an MP4 file, or sometimes it'll have the M4V extension. Um, and that is a compressed video format. If uh, you're using a, a smartphone, like an iPhone or an Android device, uh, to capture video, um, this is very much the type of uh, video format that you'll be capturing your, your, your information in. Um, and then there's H.265. That's a newer format. Uh, some newer devices are starting to record in that format now. Uh, and that's typically pretty common for uh, very high resolution images, 4K and up. Uh, so uh, that'll become a lot more common. And uh, it's also something that's becoming more common as we go into Blu-ray and, and even 8K and higher. Yeah, your, um, your point about 
uh, smartphones only outputting MP4 files puts me in mind uh, of something that I did want to mention, which is that um, we're giving you all of these standards so that you know what the preservation ideal is. But when the rubber actually hits the road, sometimes you don't have any choice. So uh, a smartphone won't output an AVI file because the file sizes are just too large. And so the point is to understand that and make other choices about how you are recording those video files and preserving the most amount of data that you possibly can given the options that you have for creating a particular uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs that have to happen with uh, with cameras, particularly with mobile devices. But you know, the thing about it is that you know the best camera is often the, the device you have in your hand, and so uh, you know sometimes you know you you end up working with the tools that you have. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's definitely a good point. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so going into you know our storage options, um, and and this is really important because there are a lot of different options there too, and, and newer technologies that are coming out. Um, you know, for for quite a while, uh, you know, hard disks were you know standard equipment on most computers, and and they're still very much the the dominant type of storage platform. If you have a large data center, or if you're doing something, uh, you know, sort of on a business or enterprise level, uh, even within libraries. Um, but of course now there are also devices that use solid state equipment. So uh, you know solid state storage devices uh, are pretty common on laptops. Um, you know if you're using a smartphone or a tablet, um, you know guaranteed you're using an SSD in there. Um, and then there are some other options like removable disks, uh, you know USB flash drives, and uh, you know some places uh, use backup tapes. Uh, as a storage option, and then you have your cloud options as well. You know the the most common services are out there. You know there's Amazon, uh, Amazon file storage systems, Dropbox, Google Drive. Um, if you're using Office 365 where you work, uh, you know Microsoft OneDrive is probably going to be common. Uh, you know Apple has iCloud. Um, so those those are all different options there, and it's really important to consider all of these because um, you know we have this this paradigm uh, when you're when you're doing a uh, backups and multiple copies. Um, a lot of people um, you know, take for granted that the one copy of data that they're going to have is, is going to be pretty stable, but um, you know, that's not always the case. You know, hard drives crash, uh, you have laptop failures, um, you know, there might be uh, you know, natural disasters, that sort of thing. Um, so you know, how many copies of your data is, is a, a good amount to have? And, and we generally try to, to teach people the, the three, two, one philosophy in, in dealing with your storage. Um, so three, two, one, um, we're talking about you know, three copies of your data, um, at least two different storage formats. So say you have uh, you know, uh, the main copy on your hard drive um, and you make backups on say uh, you know, DVDs or if you do a tape or perhaps you do it on a USB drive or even a, a, you know, a, a cloud storage provider. Um, that would be really useful because that helps you out with last uh, element, one, uh, at least one backup copy should be off-site. So three copies of your data, two different storage formats, one backup copy off-site. And that can be either just uh, as simple as a, another hard drive in a different physical location, um, or you can use uh, you know, one of the cloud services to, to help you out with that possibility. And, and that off-site is really important because if you have you know, something catastrophic happen, you know, hopefully that, that never happens to you, but if it does, um, you know, the physical loss can be pretty bad, and it could affect your backups if they're in the same location as well. Um, right. So that offsite helps you out with that strategy. So now let's get down to the nitty gritty about the reality. <laughs> um, how do you start to preserve the digital objects that you have and create the best possible digital objects uh, for moving forward into the future? And the first step for your preservation workflow is really going to be an inventory. We all have digital files that we have, um, and a lot of us have images and audio and video that we've taken, uh, but we may just not have attended to it in, in a systematic way. And so you want to take stock of the objects that you already have in your collection. What are they? 
gathering the technical metadata about them. And one way to gather technical metadata about your files, of course, if you're working on a PC, you can right click and get some of that information in the, uh, in the, out of the metadata there, but there's also a software, a free open source software program called Media Info that you can download and we've linked to that in our resources at the end of the presentation. And all you have to do is drag and drop the icon for your digital object into the Media Info interface and it will give you all the technical metadata right there, right up front. Um, you also, once you know the technical metadata, you want to look at it and determine whether or not it meets the standards. And what this will do is it will tell you what the settings on your devices are and whether or not you need to adjust them so that you can meet an archival standard that you aspire to creating your digital objects with. Um, you also want to take stock um, and evaluate the files that you have. What condition are they in? And we have a link out um, to a resource document a little later on checksums. That's a process uh, for checking the integrity of your digital files, and Isaiah will talk a little bit about that. Um, the second step of your workflow, once you know about the technical metadata, is to evaluate your device and apps according to the goals for the creation of your digital objects. Are you trying to create cultural heritage materials or is this just a personal archiving project for your own family history? Either way, it's important to attend to um, what type of standard you want to use in order to create your digital objects and make sure that the software and hardware that you're using to create them, your smartphone, a digital video camera, a digital audio recorder, making sure that those meet the needs that you have for the goals that you want to um, use. So Isaiah and I took the liberty of going through, because as he said, the best digital device you have is the one you have on you. And so he and I did some evaluations of apps for the creation of digital and audio uh, digital audio and video objects. Um, I took the Android device because I have an Android phone and for digital audio I evaluated a number of audio apps and these two, the Parrot app and the Voice Recorder, I examined according to these standards, the sampling rate, the bit depth, the channels, the recording format, and the bit rate to determine whether or not the app would allow me to adjust those settings. And I found that in both cases, the Parrot app and the Voice Recorder, they outperformed some of the other apps that I was using. The Parrot app is a little more limited, and you can see that in order to adjust settings, I had to go into a number of different menu options. So I had to go into the source option of the preferences menu to change the channels from mono to stereo and then I had to go into the quality portion of the preferences menu to adjust the recording format that I wanted and the sampling rate. Um, the voice recorder app uh, had a lot more options for adjusting the settings. It uh, both apps were perfectly fine. Both let me create um, minimum archive audio files, but the voice recorder app had some more advanced settings that allowed me to sort of upsample a little bit more than the Parrot app did. For digital video, I evaluated two apps. Um, the most nimble, best app that I evaluated was the Cinema FV5 Lite. And let me say that just because I found it to be the best app doesn't mean that these apps are the best for your purposes. I'm not endorsing them in any way. I'm just saying for the purposes of evaluating them according to our standards, I found that these allowed me to adjust the settings in the apps the most so that I could meet whatever um, archival quality standard I wanted to use. So the FV5 Lite had a number of different options. It not only let me adjust the settings to archival standards for the video, but also for the audio 
portion of the moving image recording. I wanted to show you the PowerCam app. It's very simple, very easy to use, um, but the only option that I had when using this app was to adjust the screen resolution. I couldn't make any other adjustments within the app. And so if you just want to make sure that you're getting the right screen resolution, this app is perfectly ser serviceable and easy to use. Um, I, uh, you know, it, again, it's a matter of preference and choices as to what your goals are for preserving your digital objects into the future. Right, and for the iOS side of things, because you know I, I tend to have uh, you know quite a few Apple devices at my disposal here. Um, I you know looked a lot. I, I looked around for uh, some good uh, audio recording apps. Um, there is a built-in voice recorder on the iPhone, but it doesn't give you a lot of options. Uh, it compresses by default, and uh, you know it's basically designed for ease of use. Um, so if it's something you need very quickly, you know it, it is there. Um, but if you have a little bit of uh, you know time to plan, um, you know there are other options on the App Store, uh, some of which are free, and and you know some of which are, are a bit of a premium. Uh, a couple of just examples here, and again, I'm not really uh, you know endorsing these necessarily, but they are some pretty good examples. Um, Voice Record Pro um, is really uh, very widely adjustable and adaptable. Um, to whatever uh, your recording needs might be, uh, in that um, you know if you're a beginner or you know you just want to do some very quick presets, um, it does have that option for you. So you can go you know low, medium, or high quality, uh, and it'll allow you to change the formats accordingly. Um, or there is that advanced tab, as you can see there, um, and that allows you to individually change uh, each uh, different aspect of the. Uh, recording that you're making. So if you want to get in there uh, into the real nitty-gritty details, you can do that uh, with that particular app. Um, eFusion Voice Recorder HD, uh, very similar uh, in its uh, adjustability. Um, you know, the interface is a little bit different. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit more getting used to. Um, but what is really nice about that app is that it does have uh, cloud integration. So if you want to upload something quickly, uh, you know, to whatever you know major um, you know cloud option you have that you're using. Uh, you can do that right away as you're recording, and uh, you know that does give you quite a few options as far as you know uh, editing it on a different computer or sharing it with somebody else immediately. Um, <clears throat> so going on to the video side, you know I, I really looked around for video apps, and um, you know a lot of them stopped being updated about I'd say about a year or two ago. Um, and you know as it turns out, you know there was quite a bit of a ramp up on uh, the iOS device side of things in terms of what it can do natively. And so, you know, the native recorder settings uh, on the phone itself are actually pretty good. Um, you know, you don't get, a, you know, a great individual level of, of detail because, again, you're making compromises with a mobile device when you're recording video. Um, you know, these, these are battery powered. They're limited in their storage. Um, but you do have some pretty good options there. Um, you know, going in from 720p, you know, HD all the way into 4K on some of the newer devices. And what's really nice about these settings is that, um, you know, it also does right then and there give you a reference as to, you know, how much space you're going to be using uh, with each different quality setting. So, you know, you can start out with 720p and, you know, have a 60 megabyte file for a minute of video, or you can go all the way up to 4K resolution and, you know, have a 375 megabyte file for one minute. Uh, so, so it gives you an idea of what you're what challenge you're up against if you really go into high quality. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, just kind of, again, putting this into perspective, you know, we have to consider our archival masters and, you know, when you're, when you're taking that video, uh, whether it be with a mobile device or a more professional rig, um, you're going to want to make sure that you do a bit of custody with that particular file and make sure that you're not doing a lot of, or any, um, you know, direct editing on that file. Uh, you're going to want to make a copy and, uh, you know, work on a derivative. And then, you know, when you're doing your final edit, you know, you want to choose the decompressed presentation. And, and most of the software packages that do editing allow you to, uh, you know, give you a nice guide on, on what type of settings you should use for that sort of thing. Yeah, so for metadata, um, there are a couple of standards um, that I link out to in our resources document. I link out to the PB Core standard, and the reason that I link out to that for you is because it's a standard that was created by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, specifically for use with audio and video files. But in this um, metadata spreadsheet that I created that you will get as part of your 
uh, materials after the webinar is over, I created sort of uh, I created a document that's based on the Dublin Core standard, which is a baseline standard that you can use to crosswalk to any other metadata standard. It was designed for that purpose in mind. It's very simple and easy to use, and you can see in row three what I did was I created common. Um, names for the types of metadata that you will want to be able to record and then I linked them in the uh, uh, rows one and two to the actual Dublin Core metadata elements and labels. And uh, we're a bit pressed for time, but I'm going to touch very briefly on uh, data integrity because it is kind of an important thing to consider. Um, there is a, a, a term called bit rot that you need to be aware of, and and really, you know, this is sort of the understanding that you know not every file or not every piece of data appears on you when there's a failure or there's a problem with your storage. Uh, sometimes there are very silent and very subtle changes that happen to your files um, when individual bits um, get changed or or get dropped out, and you'll you'll start noticing this as you know a, you know a pixel that may be out of place on a still image or you know pixelation that you suddenly see at a particular point in a moving image file um, or a little blip that you hear as you're uh, you know playing music, um, and all of that happens as a result of a, a loss of data integrity when a small piece of that data structure uh, you know disappears or gets corrupted. Um, there are tools out there that uh, will help you check these things out. Uh, Droid uh, at the University of Minnesota um, is a free tool that will allow you to, uh, to do uh, checksums and data integrity checking. And what a checksum is, is it's basically a digital fingerprint of your files. And even if the slightest bit gets flipped or changed, um, that checksum will also change substantially. And that will give you sort of a, a you know, canary in the coal mine kind of warning that something's happening to your files and that you may need to go back to your backups and uh, you know, get a clean file again or clean copy of that file. Um, there are some, some evolutions happening to uh, computer operating systems and mobile devices um, that aren't just quite ready yet, but they are being tested and will probably show up in the future that will have this sort of thing built in. But for now, uh, you know, we do have these tools that allow you to, uh, to do that integrity and checking yourself. And uh, the last bit I want to emphasize about sustainability is to make sure that you are thinking in the long term about your preservation efforts. Um, particularly funding um, is a sustainability issue. Um, I know personally I pay for a terabyte of storage on Dropbox which will, you know, if I wanted to only do it for audio files, it would hold uh, more than uh, 1,600 hours of audio if, um, at the minimum standard. But am I going to be able to pay that $90 every year forever? And that's something that um, I need to consider as part of my digital object sustainability plan. Uh, we have our references here, uh, documents that we use to create the, our webinar today, and also our links to resources that we discussed or mentioned during the course of the webinar. Um, we really thank you for listening, and again, let me thank Isaiah. You're awesome. Uh, oh, thank I love you working very much, with Krista. You. You're pretty awesome, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have any questions for us, now's the time. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions, can you go ahead and type them into the question box? Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with what we already have in here. Um, so, Jimenia is asking, what is the right file type for an AV master file? Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about that, and um, I, I would say that um, you, you will probably need to um, analyze the type of uh, formats and files that are in your collection uh, before you really make that decision. Um, for a lot of uh, the you know, videotape archives that we have here at Rutgers, we went ahead with uncompressed AVI. Um, 
So that's, that's one option. On the other hand, we also have a lot of born digital video that's coming in now. So that's the stuff that's built uh, off of smartphones, but also on um, you know, uh, digital video camcorders, stuff that records to an SD card. And in that case, what we really do is we, we use an MXF wrapper and um, we encapsulate the original uh, file that came into us. Um, because we figure that um, you know the the MPEG-4, you know, it's pretty high quality and it is compressed, but to uncompress it really wouldn't give us um, you know any restoration or or increase in quality. You really can't create something from nothing. Um, so so that really represents to us the you know the best quality video that we have, and it's actually pretty good um, on some of these these uh, newer digital formats. Um, so, so the X, MXF wrapper allows us to do the description, allows us to do, to do a lot of compatibility checking, and um, you know, uh, so we, we, you know, generally the, the philosophy there is to, to you basically, when it comes to born digital, you take the native file format, and, uh, and you go from there, and then, you know, you make decisions as to what your presentation is going to be. Um, you know, I wish I had a more definitive answer, but um, digital video is, is evolving so rapidly right now, it's, it's really hard to just peg down one single format and say, that's it for everything. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and John is asking what your recommendations might be for preserving audio CDs. Uh, I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, yeah, so uh, it depends on um, how old your audio CDs are. Optical media in general will last longer if you keep it in a dark, cool, dry place. But I do highly recommend that you get the data off of those CDs and put it into at least one other format um, and preferably one of those formats be a form of off-site storage. So, um, and Isaiah will talk a little bit more about this when he answers the next question that we have. Um, <laughs> so, the best way to care for your CDs is to keep them in the dark in a, as climate-controlled an environment as you possibly can, but also don't let that be your only preservation strategy. Um, get some cloud storage, buy an external hard drive. Um, one terabyte external hard drives are about $100. And if they're solid state, um, or even traditional hard drives, they're generally pretty stable. And that way, you can do checksums on them. It's, it's a little tougher to update a CD than it is to update an external hard drive. OK. And Galena is asking, can you explain 321 again, please? Sure, sure. I'll also point out that, you know, I'm a real skeptic of, uh, you know, the, the, the optical disc media because I've been burned so many times by it, so <laughs> <laughs> I really wouldn't trust it. You definitely have to get, I, I would echo Krista, you got to get that stuff off of there if you can. Um, so 321, again, so you want three copies of your data. That's the ideal. Um, you know, your, your, the stuff that you're working on on your computer, two backups. Um, at least two copies should be in a different format. So, um, so you have your hard drive or whatever's on your computer, right? Um, you may want to look at, um, you know, doing a backup on, uh, you know, a solid state or a USB uh, drive that has uh, flash storage. Um, or you might want to consider a cloud provider like Dropbox or OneDrive. Um, and that'll help you out with the one, uh, 321, is uh, one copy needs to be off-site, so in a different location. And you know, that can be cloud or it can be as simple as uh, another hard drive that's, that's being held somewhere else, maybe in a, you know, a different office uh, you know, across town, or you know, maybe you're working with something like Iron Mountain, which you know, manages that sort of thing for you, or you just want to use you know, Amazon Web Services or something like that. Great. Um, and actually, this is a great wrap-up question. I know you guys had some resources, but Sarah was asking, you know, if you have any other good resources for just staying on top of these issues. I would say uh, one really great resource is um, LERTS, the Library Resources and Technical Services Journal, if you can get access to it. Um, most of their issues are open access online. Um, but also, Isaiah's blog is an awesome way to keep up with these <laughs> issues. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, updating that a little bit more now. It's page, the number two pixel.org, so page2pixel.org. Fantastic. 
Um, you know, and we're running right about at time, so um, in the interest of, of moving along and making sure people can get on with their day, um, I'm going to say that there are more questions. Uh, any questions that you submitted will be answered after the webinar by Krista and Isaiah. Um, thank you guys all for, for participating and asking questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, close up the questioning period for this particular presentation. Thank you, Krista and Isaiah, for your informative webinar on preserving our digital lives. Thank you to Jessica for moderating the questions. I also want to give another thanks to all of our Preservation Week sponsors. Thanks to their generosity, we were able to offer this session at no cost. Thank you to all of our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form along with links to today's recording and slides. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEC CE committee improve its webinars and plan future events. Alex now offers certificates of attendance to webinar participants. More information on this will be included in the email you receive. Information about all Alex webinars can be found on the Alex homepage. Please check out our web courses and upcoming e-forums. Suggestions for webinars and other continuing, continuing education opportunities are welcome at any time. Please contact any members of the Alex CE committee or submit a proposal for a webinar using the online form on the Alex webpage under Online Learning. I would like to thank Catherine Balick for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support she and her colleagues on the Technical Support Subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other Alex continuing education events again in the future.